feed them a little bit, you give them a rank. And, and I started thinking to myself, this isn't right. That's not the way I did it. That's not the way I came up. You know, it was blood, sweat and tears, sacrifice. Welcome. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 494 with Sifu Georgian Verrigan. I'm Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host. I'm the founder here at Whistlekick. And what do I do? Well, I do the same thing we're all doing over here. We're supporting the traditional martial arts. If you want to see everything we're doing, go to whistlekick.com. It's our digital home. There are things constantly being added in support of the arts. One of the things you can find over there is our store. Use the code PODCAST15 to save 15% off anything that we have there. This podcast, Martial Arts Radio, gets its own website, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. That's right. We keep it easy. The show comes out twice a week with the goal of connecting, educating, and entertaining you, the traditional martial artist. If you want to show your appreciation for what we do, you can do a number of things. You can make a purchase, share an episode, follow us on social media. You could tell a friend. You could pick up one of our books on Amazon. You could leave us a review somewhere. Or you could support the Patreon. Patreon.com slash whistlekick. It's the place to go. You can jump in for as little as $2 a month. Let us know what you think. Let us know that you love the show. But if you step up to five, we're going to give you more stuff. And honestly, the more you contribute, the more we give you. I had a great conversation with Sifu Verrigan. We talk about what it's like to assume a role at a younger than average age. We talk about her start, her middle. We talk about where she's at now. We talk about all the things that you might expect, but it's a little different with her. And I'm not going to color it or predispose you to thoughts on it because I want it to stand on its own. I want you to have your own takeaways. So instead of trying to, I'm just going to get out of the way and let you listen. Sifu Verrigan, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Well, good morning. How are you? Good morning. I'm great. How are you? Very good. Thanks. Good. Good. You're on cup of coffee number two. I limited myself to one this morning. I'm always nervous when we have an early interview about mm-hmm. my, uh, my hydration levels. I see. And, and I, I, won't, I won't elaborate more than that, but I'm jealous of your second cup. <laughs> I need it. I need it. I've been up since 630, so I'm good. Hey, me too. All right. Me too. We, we do a daily show on YouTube, a live YouTube show at 630. Mm. So I roll out of bed, you know, about 610, 615, make that first cup. Uh, that's actually the name of the show is First Cup. There you go. And uh, stumble to the couch. Okay. All right. Yeah. Now you, you're in Michigan, right? I am. I'm sitting here as a, a, on the shores of Lake Superior. It's oh. a cloudy day, but the geese are coming in. It's a good sign. Oh, cool. The lake never froze this year. That's, I don't know what that means, but. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm excited for spring. Yeah. Yeah. That, that makes two of us as I sit and look out the window with the snow coming down. Oh, jeez. Enough uh... already. <laughs> Enough. <laughs> oh, well, you know, and, and now given the, the social climate mm-hmm. that has developed, mm-hmm. you know, of, of course, you know, when we have interviews with people, we don't, we don't generally put times and, and or rather days and dates on them, you know, because mm-hmm. people go back and they'll listen years from now, you know, to this episode, to other episodes. But as we're talking, there's a lot happening, keeping people at home due to illness. And yes. uh, I mean, what, what worse way to make cabin fever more, you know, to compound the, the feelings of that than to say, now you can't leave the house. Yeah. Well, if I can speak to that for just a minute, because yeah, we, sure. have, we have Please. a very relevant situation going on because of this, you know, as a public health issue, Large crowds, are, you know, they're asking people to, to avoid large gatherings. Well, we have a charity tournament within our system, within our family schools in New Hampshire that we've been running for, this would be year 31. And it's a tournament that raises money for local hospice programs. Um, I started that because I lost my father and my sister both to cancer. And hospice was not really available at that time. And it, I see it as a very beneficial program for a lot of of families locally. So anyway, point being, this tournament was scheduled for April 18th of this year. And in conversations with the local CDC in New Hampshire, they are supporting a recommendation to postpone that. So for the first year in 31 years, we will be postponing our Kick for Cancer tournament and are looking to reschedule that for September. We're hoping September 19th 
it'll either be the 19th or the 26th, but we will get information out to everybody on that. But it is a big deal. I mean, we've been running this tournament. It's the longest running nonprofit event in the state of New Hampshire. And it's a big deal to uh, to have to postpone it. But the public health issue is at times we'll have, you know, capacity of a gym filled with people, not just uh, uh, participants, but also spectators. And spectators mean aunts and uncles that may be over 60, grandmas and grandpas. And we need to be really paying attention to that population. It's not so much the young folks, but the young folks can carry the virus. It's the effect that it's taking on the, on the older uh, more senior generation. So we're very aware of that. And as a public health consideration, we will be postponing our kick for cancer schedule for April 18th to September of this year. Yeah. So you, you opened up that perfect opportunity for me to <laughs> say that. So I didn't yeah. forget it because we just made the decision well, yesterday. So, and I saw the decision yesterday for two other tournaments yeah. that I'm aware of, you know, one that I was going to be attending one that, you know, we have a competition team and, mm-hmm. and they follow, you know, a, a couple circuits. And, sure. And, one of these tournaments was on that circuit and here we are, you know. Yeah, it's the right thing to do. You know, it, it, we talk a lot about staying healthy and being healthy. And and part of that is public awareness and, and realizing that we're we're families, you know, and we can go out and do something and, and be okay with it, but we can bring it back. And, and if somebody's got asthma, somebody has a an over, underlying condition. I'm also an acupuncturist. So my office, okay. actually, I have closed for the next two weeks. Oh, most wow. of most of my patients are veterans and most of my patients are over 60. So it's like everybody just take a breather, a little social distancing, go home, play checkers mm. kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So there we go. We got that out. <laughs> I, I think this is the first time we've opened the show talking about illness and, and yeah. infection. And talking, but... and talking about public awareness and doing the right thing. Isn't yeah. that what we do as martial arts? We try to do the right thing. You know, we make the consideration we're not over, we're not panicked people, we don't make decisions hastily and without information. The same as if you're entering a sparring match, you don't make decisions without more information and you do your observations, you collect your facts and you do what you have to do. So moving on. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, as anyone who has started listening has figured out, you know, Mm -hmm. you've, when you're talking about things that have happened for 30 something years uh you've you've been in this game for a while you've been training teaching Mm -hmm. a martial artist for a while so why don't we why don't we rewind that tape to the to the zero mark and how'd you get started well i you know martial arts was never in my younger life i didn't think much about it It, it, you know i I started in martial arts about i think it was 1976 1977 right about then i'd moved up to the boston area from uh I grew up in Miami, which is another reason why I find winter so incredibly painful. But um, I grew up in, in Southern Florida. There wasn't, martial arts wasn't in my life. But anyway, I moved to Boston and uh, I don't know what keyed me in. I think I, I had gotten into the working world and started to feel that feeling of not being able to be as physically active as I was when I was in college and, and other places and was looking for something that fit my schedule. And right around the corner from me was a small Kajukempo school that was, I believe the deal was three months, $99 for a uniform. And I thought, who can't do that, right? So I started, and it was the, called New England Health and Self-Defense. It was in Marlboro, Massachusetts, and they were teaching Kajukempo. And uh, that was my beginning. And I started going two nights a week, as most do. And as ranks improved, you know, I I started going four nights a week. And then if you were uh, a certain level, you could attend the beginner classes sort of in the back as a a reminder or a refresher on some of the new, you know, the older material you had been working on and then carry that into the, the next class. So I was going two hours a night, four nights a week and continue with that, I think, in 19... 79, so close to 78 or 79, two and a half, three years later, I got my black belt. And I was the only woman in the school. So I went to a grading that had eight men, myself, and unfortunately, one man who showed up late, which (laughs) is just, 
he's I love him. He's a dear friend, but I'll never forget that he showed up late. I mean, I just can't imagine showing up late to a black belt rating. Anyway, um, got my black belt. Um, was really into it at that point. It had started to wrap its dragon's tail around me and around my soul. And I left the work that I was doing. I was in the communications industry. I left that and went to uh, open a school. And I had a school in Acton, Massachusetts for a while and opened up a couple other schools, one in Fitchburg and um, one in Belmont, Massachusetts. So I was right in the center hub along the highway there in Massachusetts. And in, I think it was 1980, 1981, I got my second degree. And then things changed. I mean, it was a time in the martial arts when there were systems or, or um, large groups that were, to me, it appeared as though they were more interested in sort of franchising out the martial art school aspect than they mm. were in protecting and maintaining the integrity of the training and the integrity of the style. That's, that's probably a very kind way of saying it, but there were people who were basically selling black belts. You know, if you uh, paid a certain fee for a black belt program, whether you had met the quality standards that previously had been in place, whether you had met those standards or not, you were still a black belt. And sometimes in like six months or nine months and then, opening schools. And, and what happened is the art started to water down. This is all my perspective. This is from the perspective of my mind, sure. that the quality of the art started to water down. And we started seeing people who felt, because they were told that they were there, felt they had the skills to do what they had been training to do when really their foundations were just not there. And I left the martial arts for a while. I, I just, I had, I had a business partner who had some personal issues going on and I felt I needed to separate from that. And I did. And I went out on my own, closed my school. Actually, I turned my school over to a young gentleman named John James, who now uh, went on to train. He went on to train with Nick Sirio. His uh, title, I believe now is Shihan. He was my first black belt and we still have a, very close relationship, and he is still out there today uh, promoting and making sure that the history, lineage, quality, and integrity of Nick Sirio's system stays maintained. So, you know, kudos to John. If he for, gets for those chance. of you who may not live in the Northeast, that's a, a big Kempo name. Yeah, big Kempo area. Name. Big, and we have a connection there. As I get more into history, how Nick Sirio came into my life how that connected. But oh, great. so John went on to train with Nick and, um, and I closed my school. I gave it to him. He went on. Uh, he's a, he is in the medical field right now. John is, but anyway, I traveled around looking for, you know, that, that black belt that uh, loses a teacher or closes a school or moves away. And you're trying to find that connection again somewhere. I mean, I don't, I, I think that there are probably many black belts out there who have attained that level and realized at some point shortly after that, that that wasn't the end, you know, like that's the beginning. And, you know, you say that so often after you achieve the level of black, it's like, wow, okay, I did it, but that can't be the end because I'm really hooked now. There's got to be more to it. There's got to be more to learn. There's got to be an, a continuing path somewhere. So I, uh, I was in the Massachusetts area, so I tried a few different schools. I went to a Shotokan school for a while, and uh, that was good, except the teacher, he was, he was amazing. He was like, you have to stop the circular stuff. And I thought, you know, this, I didn't realize Kaji Kempo was that circular. And I still, I still see a little bend to it, because I also do Kung Fu. So I see a little bend to, to Kaji Kempo, but there is no bend to Shotokan. And what I was doing, everything was straight in lines, straight in lines. And, you know, sometimes someone would do something and I'd move to the side or move around him and he'd say, you can't do that. And I'd be like, okay. But I trained with him for a while. I'm trying to think. He's still in Natick, Massachusetts. He's a master teacher. Um, 
it will come to me. He also wrote for Black Belt Magazine for a while, a really good, excellent instructor in Natick Mass. Um, I went to Boston, trained a little bit in, with Yao Li in Kung Fu, and he had a branch school out in Billerica, Mass. And I went there for a while and trained there. And I was just searching for the next thing. And one of my dear friends who I had, had uh, been at my black belt, my very first black belt test, he was actually the gentleman who came in late, who also got his black belt, had a school down in uh, close to Rhode Island. And he taught Taekwondo on Mondays and Wednesdays. And he asked me if I would teach Kajukempo on Tuesdays and Thursdays. So I started back again, teaching a little bit with him. And one Saturday, he said, you know, we're going to have this guy come up from Smithfield, Rhode Island. His name is Bill Gregory. And he's got a school down there. And um, he teaches Kajakempo, but he also teaches Pai Lum. And he's connected with um, Daniel Pai. And it's going to be Saturday. It's just going to be black belts. So why don't you come on down? I was like, okay. So we show up and there's a group of us that have been still together. We're friends. We've been friends almost 40 years. and. This guy pulls up in this red Corvette, top down, probably a 63 Corvette, maybe a 60, just a gem of a car. And he's a good sized guy. And he gets out and he's got, he's Italian and he's got the Italian chains on and the big rings. And I'm thinking, I don't know. I don't know about this, but let's do it. And he comes in and he's got on his uh, Psalm at this point. He's taken off his jewelry. And we worked for three hours with this guy. It was my first introduction to Grandmaster Gregory, my first introduction. At the time, his title was Senchen. And um, we did a form where we were, well, we were doing an exercise set first on in close, being in close, which was something that is a little bit different than what I had been used to. You know, most of my traditional instruction in Kajikempo from the, from the very basic set in combination self-defense techniques where, which you practice they're usually numbered and they they give you a a good tour around all the tools that you have available for self-defense and they almost always have a step back so there's always creating a distance to give you that little bit of a millisecond to to respond and with pylum everything is moving in you don't concede so we were working first on being in close. And there was a lot of rolling on the takedowns and changing arms, a little bit of Aikido in there because the Grandmaster Gregory had studied some Aikido. And I loved it. I absolutely loved it. And I found him to be a very cordial man, a very kind man, very generous in the sharing of his knowledge. There were, you know, he was very open to any questions that we had. And uh, not, I mean, could be a talker and could be very social, but when it came to training, it was about training. And, you know, sometimes you can go to a seminar and there's a lot of gabbing. There was no gabbing. It was just do it. Let's work on it. Ask questions. Let's, let's fine tune it. Let's make it better. And that was my first meeting with Grandmaster Gregory. Like I said, at the time he was Senshin. And I was living in... Um, in the middle of New Hampshire at the time. And I would drive down to Smithville, Rhode Island two days a week for training. And I did that for years. And uh, he became my teacher. He accepted me as a student. This was probably the early 80s, 1980s. And I trained with him until his passing in 2001. So that has been a very brief kind of synopsis of my journey to where I got at this point. Um, in 2001, when Grandmaster passed, we did a traditional year of mourning where nothing changed. There were no promotions. There were no gradings. There, everything, it was as if time stood still for a year. And uh, after that year of time, he had stated in his passing documents that he had wanted me to, to secede him as Grandmaster of the family. And I could talk a little bit more about how he got that title at a later, you know, later on, but just in the chronology of how I got to where I am. And so in 2002, right there, just outside of Laconia, New Hampshire, um, there were, it was a very traditional passing. It's called Passing of the Swords, where the family swords, we have two katanas that are family swords. 
Uh, there was a huge ceremony, not just attended by members within our pylum system, our Kajakempo system, but also members from the New Hampshire, Massachusetts, Maine, Connecticut, Rhode Island, family, heads of families, families that still exist today, you know, the Sikoron family, the Nima family, um, there's a Ke the Kempo family from, from down in Rhode Island, the Pylum family from Massachusetts. All of these people came together and acknowledged the, my ascension to Grandmaster of the family. And as Grandmaster Gregory's um, lifetime partner said to me, she said, you know, he's not doing you any favors. <laughs> and and I, I didn't get it at the moment, but I can tell you, um, being the person who's who really holds the torch for ensuring that the the longevity of the knowledge is harder than it sounds, because I not only need to make sure that my instructors are being fed with knowledge that I'm still teaching, that I'm still looking at their that what they're doing, encouraging them to ask questions and challenging them to ask questions about how they're moving forward. And at the same time, supporting them as they bring in new students, as they continue to feed that base of new little karate people and new little Kung Fu practitioners, um, so that the style, the system, the way that we teach, the way that we think, the way we move forward is maintained into the future. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of a brief how I got to where I am. and. Uh, I love what I do. It's great. Yeah. And I suspect everything we talk about from here will be some kind of offshoot Absolutely. from that story. Absolutely. And the first place I want to go, I want to go back. I want to go back to that that point you described in the early 80s that uh, I, I suspect was even more impactful than the words you used made it sound. You're talking about this realization that there was kind of this race to the bottom in the martial arts community in the, in the early 80s. You know, a lot of people who weren't around then, and, and I was very young then, so I, I, I didn't even witness the heyday of the six months to black belt movement. And we've walked back a lot of that, but it, you know, it did some damage, and, and I think we're still feeling some of the impact of that now as we uh, talk or fight internally as martial artists, or however you want to look at it. But you talked about stepping away because of that, that you, here was this thing that, I mean, we can only assume you loved so much that to watch it be watered down, those were your words, hurt. And you didn't want to be even around it, even fighting against that. You know, I'm not, I'm, I, I don't want my mm -hmm. words to come across as judgment. They're, they're exploratory. Mm -hmm. And I, and I want to, I want everyone to be able to understand more of what that time was like for Sure, absolutely, and I can give you an example later on as to how I how I can express that how I express that to my students. Um, <clears throat> what I what I felt my more specifically and more personally to me is that my business partner, who was a terrific martial artist, an amazing martial artist, a wonderful man, family man, two young kids, got so caught up in wanting to. Here we had one really solid school in Acton, Massachusetts, a solid school. I had taken it over from a couple of young uh, brothers who were Kempo instructors. So it already had a base. It was so quaint. It was in the bottom of an old building in Acton, West Acton, Mass, an old apple cellar, three huge rooms. It was just perfect for teaching. But anyway, my business partner got caught up in this, well, we can start selling programs. And we can, and I was like, well, you know, I'm young, I'm 26, 25, 26. Okay, but what does that mean? Well, then we have to keep, he says, well, we have to keep getting them better and better so they keep paying. That was kind of the model. You know, you, you bring somebody in, you feed them a little bit, you give them a rank. And, and I started thinking to myself, this isn't right. That's not the way I did it. That's not the way I came up. You know, it was blood, sweat, and tears, sacrifice. Give your 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 time off, which is still time is precious, to come into work. And here, we're going to give people who uh, I just I I couldn't go there. It was I couldn't associate what I had personally put in 
to my training and my ideas and the virtues and values that had been cultivated within myself over those few years and say, let's throw that away for the dollar. I couldn't do that because all you have is your name. When it, when it really comes down to it, all you have is your name. And if you don't protect the integrity of your name, whether it be your style, your lineage, your school, your personal name, your God-given name, if you don't protect the integrity of that, where do you go? And you don't have to put other people down to do that. So rather than stay in and continue to answer questions as students would come in and ask, well, geez, you know, my brother, he goes to the school over there and whatever and whatever, and he's only been there six months and he got a black belt. Do you guys do that? How do you answer that question? You say, no, that's not the way we train, but you have to be mindful that you don't want to disparage his brother who just got a black belt in six months, nor do you want to say anything bad about another school. I never felt that you should elevate. You, can, you can't elevate yourself by putting down other people. You have to elevate yourself by hard work and perseverance and trying to do the right thing. Do we make mistakes? Absolutely. Do we go, you know, if I could go back in my mind and in time and say, maybe if I had done this, this would have worked out a different way? Of course. But at the time, I wasn't willing. I knew something inside of me said, this is bigger than me. This is bigger than me. So let me take that journey by myself because I know how I think. I know the views and values that I have. So let me not expose. I'm not going to be a part of this for my students. I'm going to step away. Let John handle it. And John did. And he kept the school for a while. And then he eventually sold it. But I'm going to take this journey by myself. So if there are pitfalls, if I do find another teacher, I can kind of decide for myself whether I'm being conned. I'm willing to be a humble student. I went into every school that I went into as a white belt. I didn't go in and say, I'm a black belt in Kempo. No, I went in and I'd said, I'd like to train. So I think I took it upon myself to take that journey by myself and figure out where are the traditionalists? Where is the integrity? Where is the value? Is it still here? And I found out it was, that there are. And the gentleman in, the gentleman in Natick that I trained with, his name is Tony Anisi. And I believe he's still there. Um, I've heard that name. Yeah, Tony, what an amazing, and he's a Shotokan practitioner, what an amazing practitioner. But anyway, and he wrote under a different name as a black, as a, in Black Belt Magazine, but I don't, I don't know what that is. But that was my point. My point was, I can take, I, I'm not going to step away from the arts, but I'm going to take this journey a little more cautiously. I'm going to seek and find for myself what I need to grow. And I don't think at the time I was thinking I'll open up another school someday, but let me, let me continue this journey by myself with the tools that I have and the knowledge I have about the art. And I can't be a part of this, uh, this franchising. I can't do that. That to me, it was, it was harder, harder than I could imagine. So that was, that was why I stepped away. It, it was hard, but I felt it was safer if I took the journey by myself because I didn't have to, I didn't have to answer those questions that might put someone else down. I didn't want to do that. That's not the way. That's not the way I, that's not the way I walk. Wow. If that's helpful. It is. It is. That's heavy stuff. And I appreciate you sharing that. Sure. Now, a, a lot of what you're talking about sounds, I mean, if I, if I can be direct, awfully mature for someone in their twenties facing these kind of challenges. Cause that, that's the age group where I see people really, um, let's say kind of indoctrinated mm -hmm. in some very interesting martial arts uh practices mm -hmm. you know because here you are in your, your 20s you're you're old enough to know some things and to do some some things but still you know very subject to being impressionable by a uh powerful or larger than life instructor sort of personality mm -hmm. and i think it's it you know from what i've witnessed it's kind of that that age group where where things go off and, and uh, go awry. I agree. Uh, I mean, that, that was my twenties. Maybe, maybe, maybe I'm applying a little bit too much of my own history here, but no, I totally, I totally agree. And I agree that happens today. Uh, but I think that if, if we pay attention to what your gut is telling you, even though it's a hard decision, 
most people can recognize when, when they're being asked to do something that doesn't sit right. You know, if it doesn't feel right in your gut, stop a minute. It doesn't matter who it is who's saying it to you, whether it's someone standing up there with the title of Grand Master or Sensei or Sifu, the responsibility of that instructor to maintain that integrity and to maintain that separation between teacher and student so that you can continue to be a mentor, you can continue to be a guide. You have to pay attention to your words. You can't say things and do things. You can't be the instructor that, uh, you're probably going to cut this, but you can't be the instructor that's absolutely fish faced on Saturday night with your students and expect them to respect you on Tuesday when they come to class. There has to be a separation. We don't have to be perfect Puritans, but we have to set an example for our students because because they do look to us as something other than. I mean, I remember looking at Daniel Pye the first time he came in. He was like a mystery man. I'm like, who is this Chinese Hawaiian guy? What is he doing? And he's doing these amazing things. His hands were monstrous. You know, he's throwing people left and right. He barely touches. Uh, you know, he does, sometimes wouldn't have to touch you. And I would see people move. So I'm like, what's that? I want to know that. Now, I could do a couple of things. I could be so enamored by that that I would follow him off a cliff. Or I can be an observer, be a respectful observer, attend the classes. If he ever gets to the place where he wants to share it with me, I can decipher at that point, is it BS or is it real? But you have to take some personal responsibility. But I get what you say. I have young instructors in their 20s and 30s. And taking them through those, creating a channel of communication with them that's open and honest and creating a, a place where they can ask questions that they may not ask each other or, you know, or others, and not telling them what to do, but showing them maybe what I would have done or have done in that situation, and, and then having them continue to communicate with me as to where they're going. I have one, two, three young black belts right now, uh, two seconds and a third, who are running schools in New Hampshire. One is brand new, one's two years old, and one's three years old. They need a lot of guidance. They have people their own age coming to them because they're in their late 20s and early 30s. People coming to them, at looking at them as leaders for the first time in their life. Up to this point, they were students. Now they're leaders. And they are understanding now the importance of being mindful of that. You know, some of them, some of their students are older than they are. And we're looking at them as leaders. So we really have to take that responsibility of instructors seriously and make sure that our words and our, follow our deeds, you know, that, that we keep and we keep that separation between, not that you can't be best of friends, because I am best of friends with some of my students, but there are certain, certain levels of discussion that don't happen at certain levels of training. That was my bringing up anyway. Like, I, I can't remember, I'm trying to think the first time I remember sitting in a room where Grandmaster Gregory and Dr. Pye were having a conversation. I mean, that was not something that was open to everyone. And the conversation that they had would not have been a conversation they would have had in the Quan or the dojo that day with all the white belts and, you know, purple belts and brown belts. So there is a separation and a, and a responsibility we have as instructors. But young people, it's important. You know, the, the maturity level, even today, there's less social interaction. So sometimes it's confusing. It's confusing as to how we move forward. But I always say to them, go with your heart. What does your heart tell you? You have a feeling. You have a feeling in your gut. The same, the same little antenna that go up when you're feeling that moment that you might be in danger. You know that. You just get this, I don't know what it is. It's like the hair on your body says, just wake up a little bit. You know, just kind of expand your vision a little bit, expand your thoughts, expand your heart, you know, pay attention. You're somewhere. I don't see it yet, but I feel it. It's the same thing when you're working with a student. You observe them, you listen, you pay attention to the subtleties, whether they're verbal or not. And you try to help to move them in a direction within the parameters of the art. You know, we don't need to get into people's personal lives unless we're invited, but in terms of the art, you we have parameters to follow. We have, you know, we a lot of us have curriculums that have been, you know, 50 years old. So 
we we have steps that we can follow. We have short term and long term goals, and I think I think those are helpful. I agree. Now you you talk about younger instructors who, mm-hmm. you know, I I was one of these. You know, I I, I my school I had my school when I was twenty two, mm-hmm. and here was this built in group of people with similar interests who thought highly of me and gave me money mm-hmm. for for my time and my knowledge. And it's it's kind of hard to not uh not feel puffed up about that. So oh. when you work with, you know, you you gave the example of this this newer instructor, newer school owner, mm-hmm. how are you advising them? I assume you're you're engaged with them from time to time and and guiding them from your role mm-hmm. as their as their superior. Mm-hmm. You know, what, what kind of conversations are you having with them? Um wow. Um Usually what will happen is I'll get a question. I'll get this email, you know, and it'll be, you know, first checking in, I hope you're doing well kind of thing. And then it's five or six paragraphs of, of things that they've probably been thinking about for a while, whether it be, um, I, I'll give you an example. I had, I, I had a contact with a young black belt one time and he was, he was like, you know, I have students that are really good at kata and I have students that really want to learn how to fight. Now you've probably heard that before. You know, I don't. I don't really want to learn kata. I, I don't understand it. I think it's really slow. I'm just here to learn how to fight. And it's like, you know what? Then we're going to do basics for like five years. So I'm sure. So you could just get used to standing in a line, getting a pad, whatever, or you can do kata because kata is basics. That's all it is. It's basics put together in a pattern. So it's that kind of conversation I'll have with him. It's like, so I, I'll say to him, so if you had asked me that question when you were a brown belt or you were a green belt, what do you think my answer would have been? And they'll say, oh, I know what your answer would have been. Your answer would have been, you got to do both. I'm like, and why would that be? So I can use personal exchanges I've had with them because they know me. They know, they know how I feel about traditional training. They, I know, I mean, I've worked with people who, um, my, youngest, my youngest student was four, my oldest student was 72. So I've worked a range of physical abilities. I've worked with people who are autistic. I've worked with people who are in wheelchairs. So your challenges as an instructor cause cover a wide range. But for that young instructor, it's go back to your personal experiences with your teacher, which brings us to our previous segment. If your if your teacher previous if your instructor took the time to to actually sit down with you and critique what you're doing not just constantly puff you up because ego is a good thing. There's nothing wrong with ego. If you don't have a little ego, you know, that's a little bit of your, your confidence. That's a little bit of who you are. It's when your ego overrides your sensibilities. You know, if you're standing against somebody who's seven foot tall and weighs 350 pounds, you better put your ego in your pocket, you know, but so there are times to have that. I think it's important. You're the leader. I remember going to my school and looking at my instructor and wanting to look like that. I want my kick to look like that. I want my punch to look like that. I want to be able to take that person down like that. So you do have a responsibility to maintain your your ability to look and be effective in the martial arts. You have to do that as an instructor. If you're just standing in front of the room and you're looking at a teacher whose uniform never gets sweaty, who doesn't ever throw a kick during basics, who's just walking around and hearing themselves chatter, it's like, hmm, do I know? But if you've ever been grabbed by your instructor and thrown to the ground, you're like, okay, yeah, I want to do that in a night, you know, in a nice way, not a mean way, sure, sure. but in a nice way, <laughs> that's who you want to be. That's who you want to be. And I, I hear how I have grown over the years through the instructors I met during those periods or who are now instructors, but through the st- students I met during those periods. When I was in my twenties and thirties, I was a very physical instructor. You know, probably into my 40s, even a very physical instructor that I, because I had to be. I was teaching beginners. You know, you have to be hands on with them. How do you teach control to someone if you don't show them control? You know, how do you teach balance uh, and being able to shift your weight? How do you teach that without demonstrating that on someone? You know, how do you teach a safe ta- takedown so that you can practice with someone effectively? at a moderate to, to full contact speed, how do you do that unless you show them how to do it? 
Otherwise, you're just saying it. So I think that carries on too into those young instructors. It's like you have to be able to show it. You have to be able to do it. And then you have to be able to teach it, which then gets you into the element of all my students don't learn the same. Some of them learn by touching, some of them learn by hearing, some of them learn by writing it down, some of them learn by doing it all. They, they need all of it, and then they need time. So I try, to, and I try to, to talk to my instructors about that. You know, have your students keep journals, have them keep, have them keep notebooks. You know, give them 10 minutes, five minutes at the end of every class. Make it part of the class. Write in your notebook what you just learned in your own words. I don't care if you're six. You have to do stick figures. They can do something. And that way it begins to get them in a pattern of learning that, it, it, you know, I'll write it down. I'll do it. I'll practice it. I'll do it every morning and every night. And, you know, when I get up in the morning, when I go to bed at night, I'll do whatever I've just learned for a few weeks, maybe a month, and then it sticks with me. So that's, you know, that when young people come to me, I try to just help them with in ways of things that I have found to work in a positive way for myself. And they take it or they don't take it. And sometimes they don't. I've had instructors who say, well, I'm going to try this. And I'll say to them, I'll support that. But if your students start looking shabby, I'm going to let you know. I'm going to let you know. I'm not going to tell them. I'll never tell them. But I'm going to let you know. And they're like, okay. So because I do make... I do all, I still do all the black belt ranking and I still go out to the Northeast at least once or twice a year. So I do seminars. I see students at all levels and I judge my instructors by the way their students look. You know, if your students still look like they're solid, they still look like they're, you know, they're carrying the torch for Kajikempo, karate and pylon kung fu. I'm good with that. Whatever your style is of teaching. But if your students start to show a slacking in any way, I'm going to go to you because that's where it's coming from. Have you had that conversation? Oh, sure. Oh, Can, can yes. you tell us about that? Because that sounds like a really difficult conversation to have uh, for, for both sides. It is, but I have to respect, I know what it's like to run school full-time, and I know what it takes. I mean, for most of us, you have a full-time job, and then two, three, four days, four nights a week, you pack up in your wonderful, love it, everyday gi, or SOM, and you go to the school and you love what you do, but then the next morning you're back at your job. So for many, many schools, especially the small schools still going on in the New England area, and even here in Michigan, although although we could talk about that differently, it's a whole different mentality. It's Northeast is just scattered with small schools that are still going on in community centers, church buildings. You know, a lot of people don't have storefronts, but they've been around for 40 years. So anyway, that just, I have to respect their method of teaching. They're the ones that are making the sacrifice. If I try to make them into mini me's, it's not going to work. I have my life experience with me. They have their life experience. We all learn differently. Now they may have they grew up in my class, so they have a, I guess a, 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 a an outline of how a boilerplate, if you will, on on how I always ran the classes but that may not work for them. As long as the student is getting the material, the material is solid and understanding, it moves in a, in a coherent way. I mean, there are reasons why there are black belt forms and there are white belt forms, you know, in kata. I mean, if you're gonna teach a black belt kata to a white belt, you better teach them all the basics first. If, if not, you'll be stopping every other move you know, to, to try to get them to understand it. So there is a coherent way that curriculums move forward and they build upon themselves. So it is a hard, you know, I have, an, I have instructors who, are, who really want to just do self-defense. I mean, that's kind of their bag. That's what they love. That's what they enjoy doing, that in close contact. That's fine. But, but the normal person coming in from the street barely shakes hands with people, let alone wraps them up around the shoulder, puts a tiger mouth around their throat and throws them to the ground. I mean, that's just, so you have to understand how people come together and get to that place. Now, they might be there to learn self-defense, but you better teach them how to stand and balance and to breathe and to be, be aware of their environment. You better teach them all those things somehow as you're, as you're showing them how to punch a kick and block and move, which I think is the most important thing. You've got to move first. 
if you don't teach them all those things, they're never going to get to that fancy self-defense thing that you want to do. And so usually the conversation comes around is that they're feeling frustrated. Or I, I do a seminar at one of their schools and I'm doing self-defense and I'm, I'm constantly repeating certain um, parts of that technique and I'm realizing there's something missing here. What is it that these people aren't getting? And so I'm backtracking and fixing it and coming back and then I'll have a discussion with the instructor afterward. And whether it be your people talk too much, meaning why are beginners talking to beginners when they're trying to learn something new? They shouldn't be, they should only be listening and talking to you. So I'll have a different conversation with that instructor. Um, they'll take the information and do with it what they will. My goal is to make sure that people come through and have a solid, solid foundation in the style, a solid foundation in the system. Everyone is welcome, everyone feels safe, but we have to remember we're doing martial arts. At some point there is going to be contact. And we need to make sure that when that contact happens, that it's safe for that, that person. The safer it is for that person, the closer they will get to their opponent and the more they will begin to understand their own power and their own confidence. If you hurt them initially going in, they're going to walk away. So, yes, I want the student to stay. But for me, as the head of the family, if you are not planting solid seeds in the beginning and keeping people safe till they get to a place where they can really defend themselves, which you know sometimes can be months, even maybe a year before someone actually feels comfortable having someone punch at them, you know, it depends on the individual. We have to keep them safe and growing and learning until that time. So whatever path they take to teach, as long as the students at the other end, it's like I see the end of the production line, what I want to see needs to look like somebody who does Kempo or somebody who does Pailam or somebody who does both. Because we have schools that just teach Kempo Karate and we have just Pailam schools. And we also have bridges, which we can talk about later. But those are hard discussions to have because I don't want to poo-poo what they're doing. I don't want to say what you're doing is awful because that's not the way to help people grow. It's to kind of give them the opportunity. They need to present a plan, show me what they're doing. And then let me see the result. Let's see the results. But results, as you know, in the martial arts could take a year. It could take two years. These are long-term things. So we have to, we have to pay attention. One of the things that I really enjoy about the format of the show being, being so open is that, you know, I get to say something and, and step back and, and listen. But in that openness, because the guest is driving the conversation, we can infer a lot of things about that person and what's important to them. And what I'm starting to notice is, as you're discussing here, I'm going to guess that you are incredibly passionate, more so about the development of people, let's say, further down the line in the family than maybe even your own technique. It, it, it seems like you spend most of... I'm trying to choose my words because I, I, I want to make sure that they're coming across in the complimentary way that I mean them and not, oh, and not say, a critical way. Don't, don't um, worry about that. Say them what's okay. comfortable for you. If I, if I infer any kind of whatever, I'll let you know. All right. Sounds good. I appreciate that. Um, your energy, your time goes to the development of these students, these other instructors in a almost selfless way. And I suspect that that has been that way for a very long time. Well, I can tell you, Grandmaster Bill Gregory passed away in 2001. So it's been almost 20 years. 20 years is a long time. I have um, two young people that were going up for black belt in a couple of weeks. And I haven't told them yet, but I'll make sure I email them <laughs> before they hear this, <laughs> that uh, they're going to have to be postponed because I'm not coming out to New Hampshire. But these people never met Bill Gregory. They never met Daniel Pye. He passed away in 1993. These are the roots of our family style. I mean, the most current roots. I mean, Bill Gregory was about the same age as Nick Serio. They trained together. Bill Gregory was one of Nick Serio's black belts. If you go back at, at that time, you, all, you had all kinds of people. You had Ernest Lieb, you had 
uh, Tadashi Yamashi, you had all these people in New England and they were bringing up people very, very quickly. And that's the root. So if I can't teach people the root of the tree, I'm, tr I'm trying to teach them about people that don't exist anymore. They only exist in our heart. They only exist in the expression of our style. They only in, in, exist in the integrity and quality of what we do. That's how they exist. You know, in Chinese medicine, they call it the Shen. It's that part of you that exists after you pass. And it only exists because people talk about it and remember you, which is why it's so important. When I walk into a school and see pictures, it doesn't have to be a Kaj Temple school or Pylum school. When I see pictures of lineage, I know that those students are being taught where their style came from. Whether those men, and it's usually men, but there are some women now who have, uh, who have, have gotten to higher levels within the arts, whether those men were good people or not good people, they were carriers of a torch of their style. And we need to move the style forward. So I do take care of my black belt, but I don't get in their way. I've tried that. You know, it was a very difficult, it was a tough transition for me to go from, my title was Shigong. I was a, a, a fifth level black belt in the pylon system to grandmaster. You know, I, I was like, what, what, you know, here I'm with, I'm, I'm head of my school and all of a sudden I'm head of all the schools. You can't get in their way. These people are planting seeds and growing students and you need to be there to support them and welcome them, but you can't get in their way. So I am passionate. I'm very passionate about people who would, you know, when they say to me, oh, I've got 18 students now, or I have 40 students now. That's that's wonderful because I know the numbers. I know how many students about it's going to take to even get to one black belt. And how many of those black belts is it going to take to have one instructor? And of those instructors, how many of them will ever really open a school? I mean, you know the numbers, right? It's a, yeah, you know, not good. so you, you can't be in their way, but you have to be passionate. I am absolutely, there are two things that I have control over at this family. I have control over rank, which means I can take your rank and I can give you rank. So that says a lot, because I've learned this in 20 years. You only have control over two things. One of them is rank, and the other is curriculum. That's it. You know, if I have a school that decides it wants to go full MMA, they're not a pylum school anymore, because pylum is not MMA. White Dragon pylum is Kung Fu. And it has a particular set of systems and, and, and movements in it. Now, you can be a pylon practitioner who does MMA, but you're not going to teach it. If you're going to teach it, there needs to be, in my, in my rules, a certain percentage. It's like 85% of what you teach in your school has to be pylon or kajikempo. And one of the ways that I maintain the integrity of both of these systems to, to either keep them separate or together is I can, I'll promote a black belt up to second degree in either style. They can be second degree in Kajikempo, full Kajikempo, all the katas, the pinyons, the self-defense techniques, the bow staff, the nunchuck, all of that. And I, I'll promote up to second degree in pylum with just pure pylum training. But for a black belt instructor in my system, my style, to get a third degree, they have to have a first in, one, in the opposite style. So if you're a second degree in Pylum and you need a third degree, you need to, you need to get all of your Kajikempo katas and pinyons down before I'll promote you. And that's one of the ways that I can assure that both of the systems move forward is that any of my instructors third and above have black belts in both styles. And they have both systems and they understand the difference between the two. There are some bridges. There are some forms that we do that we call bridge forms that kind of blend them. There are forms that, uh, that look a little more Kajikempo, but they have some, some Kung Fu in it. And then others, you can completely tell they're separate styles. So we'll bring in those bridge forms first so people can kind of feel that. Um, anyone that I taught when I was teaching, all of my black belts have rankings in both styles. But it's the new ones coming up that, you know, they're like, what do I need to do for my next level? I said, you need to learn the other system. 
And they're like, oh, and I, you know, it's like, what? It's like, yes, that's what you need to do. Because we are, Bill Gregory was Kaju Kempo and he was Pylum. And I remember when he changed because we were all in geese and we were teaching Kaju Kempo. And then he came up to my school in New Hampshire and he said, and he taught a crane form and did double broadswords. And he said, Pylum, this is Pylum. And he looked at me and he said, you got to get him in Psalms. And I was like, uh, okay. And that was the change. And that was the 1980s. And we taught only Pai Lum all the way up until he passed. I didn't teach Kaji Kempo. And when he passed, I realized it had been 10, maybe 12 years. And my dear senior up in Nova Scotia, Canada, Larry McClellan, he also recognized at that point, wait a second. We're going to lose Kajikempo if we don't teach. And both of us, for a couple of years, just taught Kajikempo. And we got it back into the roots, got it back into the tree. And that's how we move it forward. But it's, yeah, it's quite a journey. It's quite, you know, recognizing the things that need to be, that need to stay together in order to move forward. And when you, when you're at the top, you have, you have very little control over that. So you have to be able to recognize the things that you have control over and just make that clear, <laughs> you know, make it really clear to everyone and then move forward. You have to be nice. You have to be generous, compassionate, and kind, but you also, they, they need to know within you exists the dragon and the tiger and that you have these tools available to you and you don't like to use them very often, but you can, if that makes sense. It does. It mm -hmm. does. You talked about assuming this mantle mm -hmm. of Grandmaster at a, an early age, an age that I mean, very few people are going to assume that role. It's, right. it's a big deal. It's, it's something that I think most of us, at least, well, I won't speak for most of us, when I think of someone kind of inheriting that Grandmaster role in a system, I'm always thinking of someone in their, at least their, their late 50s. Oh, know, yeah. usually 60s, maybe even older, depending on just how that that lineage flows. Mm -hmm. And you know, you said it's been 20 years, so we can we can you yeah. know get a get a rough right. idea right. of your age. Right. And are you thinking about that next generation of grandmaster? Oh. And if so, are you willing to talk about what that's like? Because now you've got 20 years of knowing what it's like of the yeah. challenges. Yes. And then I would assume, because of the other things we've talked about today, your goal of better preparing the person who takes over for you than you were prepared. Oh, God. You know, I had in my lifetime two experiences of that transition. And I can tell you, I have many, many friends in the martial arts who've never experienced it once. Uh, when Daniel Pye passed away in 1993, he was out of the country. And... Um, the, there was no secession. There was no plan of who was going to be, you know, he had uh, at the time um, a handful, I mean, literally less than five men who were seventh le level or higher in Pylom. One of them was my teacher, Bill Gregory, and a couple of folk, uh, higher level black belts that he had, had lived with him down in Florida and uh, not took care of him, but they were there. They were like, uh, I don't know, assistants or something, but they were black belts and they were training. I don't mean to diminish their, their level at all. So when he passed, there was a year of mourning. And then there was a huge conference in, in the center of Florida. I went to that with, with my teacher, Bill Gregory. And there was a council of seniors in the Pylum family up on the head of this. There were hundreds of black belts around this huge round table, huge round table in this place in Orlando. And there was a, a, a seating at the top of this table, just on a little bit of a stage platform, seven, maybe nine seniors. If I can, um, you know, I, I believe Tommy St. Charles was there. He's from Connecticut. He's, he's passed. Um, I believe um, Mike Kaler from Missouri was there. Obviously, Bill Gregory was there. Fred Schmitz, he's from the South, was there. Glenn Wilson was there, and they were talking in conversation about forming something called the White Dragon Society, the World White Dragon Society. 
So here you have these men who all have their own families, who all have their own thing, been doing it for years because I was the leader and nobody questioned it. Well, he had no plan. He left no plan. There was no plan. So earlier when we talked about ego, here you have sitting at the head of this table, probably so much ego <laughs> that, that you couldn't close the doors. And trying to make a decision who was going to be in charge or how that was going to look. It got, it, you know, and, and all around the room, we all had to stand up and say who we were and whatever. But I'm watching this and I'm thinking, this is not going to work to myself. I'm thinking that, but you know, my job was there to support my teacher. It went on in discussions. And shortly after that, there was a smaller gathering and that got a little heated and it all blew up and everyone went back to their homes and everyone be went back to their little dugouts and decided, you know, we're going to do what we've been doing all along and that's teach pylon and that's what we're going to do. And some people stepped out and said, I'm in charge and no, he left me in charge. And quite frankly, that was all BS. Nobody was left in charge. You know, it was because he didn't expect to die. He didn't go away ill. He fell ill and died. So there was no, when I leave, you're going to be in charge. And everything. that's not how Pi taught. Pi had people all around the world that he taught. And there was no one who was going to be in charge. It's like, do your thing. It's not, it wasn't his way of thinking. So that all blew up. So I see, I experienced that firsthand. And then when Grandmaster Gregory passed, that was a long, unfortunately, long death. And there was already the experience of what happened when Pi died and the importance of making sure there's some cohesiveness, that people understand that we need to be better prepared. And I did not know that he had listed me as the successor to take over the title until basically a couple of days before his death. That's when I knew. And when I went to his home at the day of his passing, I was greeted by people that were, you know, somebody's taking the swords because they're going to take those for a year. And this person's talking to me and don't worry about that. And I'm like, what is going on? I mean, it was a little bit confusing, but, but it all, it all coalesced. And, and there were some conditions that had to be met. I had to be close to the age of 50. I had to, they wanted me to be the age of 50, but I wasn't. But because of my years in, and because I knew a lot of these men, of these heads of these families, they agreed that would be okay. So it, it was a combination of years in the art and age in order to take that over. Taking, being, being designated as head of a family doesn't give you any more than you came in with, really. You have to kind of figure out what that means moving forward. And when I look to the future, I look at my students, I look at the people currently that I have in my field, and I say, who can realize their number one goal is to make sure that you still have something in your hands at the end of the days here. You can't just come in with your ego and say, oh, the hell with you all. You're not doing anything I want you to do. Go away. You can't do that because that's not your role anymore. Your role significantly changes. You have to sit there and listen to people. <laughs> say things and do things that you might not agree with and find a way to make a bridge. And you have to continue to cultivate those bridges and be careful what you say because 20 years has passed already. And so, you know, it's, it's always people who want to be here can be here, but they, we have rules and we have, you know, we have certain things that we need to maintain and that's what I need to hear. And if you want to go off and do this, that's fine, but it doesn't meet the standard of what I'm looking for. And I have to have those discussions. I have taken rank away from people. Anything that they, things that they have done that have brought what I think could bring a, a strong negative impact on our family name, our quality, our integrity, I will take, I've taken their rank away. And Can just you give an example that might not, you know, <clears throat> put somebody's business out there. Is there, mm -hmm. there a way you can just say it generically? Um, if uh, if it becomes if it has if it has become clear to me that someone is being dishonest, 
uh, someone is being abusive, whether it be verbally or emotionally, to students, we talked about that a little bit in an earlier segment, the responsibility of an instructor to be very clear of their boundaries and what they say and how they guide their students. If someone does something illegal, um, the illegal part would be immediately you're out, you're gone. Because I have, right now I have four schools in New Hampshire. If one of my instructors in my school in New Hampshire, I continue to let them carry that brand, and they're doing something illegal, it reflects on every other school that's there. And it's not just my schools. If we have a school, let's say, for instance, there was an example here in Michigan, and this was quite extreme, but there was a gentleman who, not I should use that word gentleman, there was a man who had a martial arts school. And he had some, some female students, which is fine. But he proceeded to then do drugs with them, tie them up in his basement, and keep them there for several days. Okay. It, no one said this is a deranged man who did this. They said there is a martial artist instructor. That's how, they, that's how they identified this man, a martial arts instructor. So the martial arts schools around here for a while took a little bit of a hit. Because if I'm a mom, I'm not going to bring my kids to a martial arts school and feel like they're safe, right? So what we do as a community reflects. So I had an instructor that he, they're no longer involved with our system at all. And all their rank has been removed. All their title and designations have been removed. Um, that was a, having their students do things um, under the guise of, if you really want to be better, this is what you have to do. And, uh, you know, I'm asking you to do this. And as your teacher, you should do what the teacher asks you to do. You know, we've probably heard these, some variation of this statement from an instructor at some point in our life. And they were injuring other students at the behest of the instructor. That's just a small example. You know, hey, I want you to take this guy down. I'm sure you've heard that before. Yeah. Or, um, you know, Somebody has a, a just just rehabbing from a broken wrist. You know, I want you to pop him in the wrist. You know, things like this. Now, I've I'm talking back 70s, 1970s, 1980s. A lot of this went on, and we did tried to do a pretty good job of weeding it out. If you had a real pr a guy that came into your school, it was a little bit of a nutcase. You figured it out quickly and you got them out. But when you see that happening now, and it's a way of promoting themselves. You know, you'll do this for me because you're loyal to me. That kind of stuff I find very disturbing. Doesn't matter whether it's martial arts or anywhere. You know, if you have the responsibility of a teacher, your job is to be a teacher. Your job is not to have people do things under the guise of if you don't, you're not loyal, and therefore I can't give you a rank or whatever whatever the prize is at the end. So that's, that's that instructor's gone. And anyone who does that in my system would be gone. And I would expect the other people that I know in the New Hampshire area, especially the heads of the families there, they would do the same. It's a challenging situation. And, and, you know, I, I started to get a little hot under the collar as you're talking about this quote unquote, martial artist who tied women up in his yeah. basement, because what, one of the things that's gotten me fired up for a very long time is the fact that because we don't police our own, we we end up with this uh, this public image that the general public is just far too happy to try to tear down because we're not showing internal uh, standards yes. that we're holding each other to. You know, absolutely, because, absolutely, you know, and, and I also celebrate the good things. I mean, when when I have the opportunity to gather with other schools or other leaders, you know, I'll tell them the good things we're doing. You know, I'll, that's the time I introduce them to maybe a new black belt or introduce them to this. And they know them because we try to have a cordial relationship and see that we can celebrate the good things. And we can also identify if I remove someone's rank, I let every school in the area know. So, you know, I want them to know this person is no longer has anything to do with us. That's my job. That's not an easy thing to do. Mm. That person could continue to run a martial arts school. but all the heads of the families, and we've had open conversations, they know if I hear something from them, I pay attention to it. 
you know, they're not putting it out on Facebook. They're not putting it anywhere. But, you know, we do try to police our own. We do try to make sure because it, in small communities, you can have, as I said before, a tiny little martial arts school in someone's garage that's been there 25 years. They're doing a good thing. We don't want to, we don't want anyone to be injured if we can help it by the, by the bad judgment, whatever, of a single person. It's an industry, but it's also a lifestyle. Hmm. Let's let's flip our timeline a little sure. bit. Let's let's start looking into the future. Sure. You know, we we've talked about some of the things that, you know, you're kind of in general addressing, but you know, if we look out over the next five, ten, however many years you want to look and, and you think about your relationship to martial arts, your training, your instruction, mm -hmm. your overseeing of organization. What are you looking forward to? And mm -hmm. and what are you hoping to maybe create? Mm. in that time wow um you know it's it's a it's a planning style that just takes so much patience you know and every year you know when the new year comes around i i ask for more patience <laughs> because i would like to things see things move faster but people develop as we develop over the years and oftentimes we don't see the results of the work for a while. Um, the next generation to me is a mystery. You know, I have, I have the, the men that I trained with that are my age and, you know, and high level. I have that next generation that's maybe in their late 40s, 50s, who are, have black belts under them. And then I have the young black belts in their 20s and 30s that are opening schools. That's that's where my intimate knowledge of the family stops. So their students, I don't know yet. So over the next few years, my goal is to get into all those schools so they know me. That's important. Otherwise, they they will skip a generation. And I I I think so. Even a presence, even being there, doing a seminar, talking about my family history, talking about our style, our family history, giving them, giving them the things, the gems that I think are important so that they, they feel a part of Pai Lam and a part of Kajikempo. So in the short term, for me, that would be five years, over the next five years, I need to get into all those schools. I need to make sure, and usually when I come to town, it's a seminar where all schools are invited. And that is also important in our family, because even though we have separate, and these are businesses for these young black belts, these are, you know, they have other jobs, some of them, some of them it's full time. They need to learn about their brothers and sisters. They need to learn that and know that there are other people close by that are learning what they learn. So there's a, that's where the ego has to go away. It's not like we're stealing students from each other. We come together as a family and do our seminars in a group where you get to meet instructors from other schools, you get to meet students from other schools, and then they start their Facebook conversations and their social media interactions, and maybe they'll, you know, so that has always been a big part of our family, too, is getting together as a family. You know, when Dr. Pai would come in, we would have black belt trainings with 100 black belts from all over. When, uh, uh, when Grandmaster Gray would do seminars, it was always everyone came. So there would be, you know, 75, 100 people there. Uh, black belts and, and sometimes brown belts. And if he taught lower levels, you know, we'd have a big gym and all the people would be there. So that family connection board, that's the short term. The long term is that hard decision. You know, uh, I'm constantly looking for candidates. I have, I'm constantly looking for candidates to carry this forward. I don't want to, and I could, of course, go for a walk today and be hit by a bus. I have written down names. And there are a few people who know about that. And, you know, those people always have the option to say no or not. But I do know what it takes to, to be the head of a family. I'm living it. It's incredibly humbling. It is um, a huge responsibility. Most of the calls that I get, I'll tell you, are not calls of, Hey, have a great day. Most of my calls are there's something going on. And I'm the person who needs to make that 
correct that if it's if it's going in the wrong direction. And that is that's been cultivated over time. So it is a position where people will go to you looking for the answer. And the answer may not be as direct as go here or go there. You have to you have to consider the whole family in every decision you make. You know, it's not a it's not a personal decision. It's a family decision and making sure that the family stays strong and that every person is supported. So in the long term, that's the, you know, I'm never going to stop. Uh, my personal training, I'm doing, I do a lot of Tai Chi. I do Qigong. I'm an acupuncturist. Uh, I dig up old pylum films. You know, I search out forms. There's one I've been working on now for about two and a half years. And um, I think maybe by next year, I'll be ready to share that. So yes, I'm still teaching. I'm still trying to pick up things that maybe fell through the cracks that haven't been taught in 20, 30 years and just yank them up and throw them out there. So, you know, my goal is to make sure is there's as much information out there on Pylum, as much information out there on Kaji Kempel that I can find and um, make sure that my students have it. So the more they have, because things do, all to the side, you find instructors, and you've probably seen this, instructors that have their favorites and things that they do well, and oftentimes that's what they teach, and they can neglect or set aside some of the things that they don't do so well, or maybe mm, yeah. they don't look so well, so they don't teach those, and somehow that sort of falls away. And yeah, some things are hard and challenging, but there's nothing wrong with saying, like for me, Am I going to do a Chinese crescent kick these days? Hell no, I'm not. I'm not jumping up in the air and throwing two kicks in the air. That's just ridiculous. But I can tell you how to do it. And I can tell you how to do it because I've been working with you and I've been teaching you and I know how your body works. So when we get to that point in the forum or we get to that point in the kata, I may do a shuffle step and still end up in the same position, but I'm going to tell you to do a Chinese crescent. And that's the way it's supposed to be done. And when you get as old as me, you can do a shuffle step. And they're like, okay. So, so <laughs> you know, that, that's what, that's how you do it. It's, it's more or less, are you in the same, are you, do you end up in the same position to be as effective as you would have been without the Chinese crescent? The Chinese crescent is the Kung Fu. You know, that's the Kung Fu. The slap in the face is, is something else. That's what you're going for. So throw out the flashy thing and then slap them in the face. But so that's in the long term. The long term is making sure that there are enough seeds planted to continue on because when I'm gone, the next person has the same job. And maybe it'll be this way, maybe it won't be this way, but the threads are, are there holding everyone together. My job is to ensure that those threads get rewound every once in a while so they're just a little bit tighter because people are people and personalities come together and not. And you know, the bottom line is we know we love the art. We know we love each other. You know, there's, there's not much you can do. I mean, you really have to do something off the charts for me to push you away. But your troubles are welcome here. You know, you're, you're welcome here. Your successes are welcome here. You know, as long as the goal within the, within the construct of Pai Loma Kung Fu and uh, Koji Kempo, as long as the goal is to move that system forward, we're on the same path. You know, whatever happens on the outside, we can talk as people. But in this construct, that's that's where I see it's like a laser just moving forward. It doesn't it doesn't have a you know it doesn't have a side path. Mm. Great stuff. Mm. If people want to reach you, find find you online, school website, social media, any anything like that, we can share with them. Um, I'm not a social media person because. Okay. I just, you know, I guess I get texts once in a while, but I don't know anything about Facebook or Twitter or any of that because I tried Facebook once and after figuring out how many people were shopping and how many people were having coffee and it was like, really? Okay, I could do better. All right. So I have, if I can, if you can bear with me, I would like to at least highlight the four schools in New Hampshire. Sure. So that sure. people, and then I've got a school down in Florida too, but the first school is White Dragon Martial Arts. It's in Gilmanton Ironworks and uh, Sifu Biochetti, and it's 603-387-0779. Um, next is uh, Sifu Nick Rollins, and he's Zenith Martial Arts. He's a pylum school. 
He has a website, www.zenithmartialarts.net. Um, he's in Concord, New Hampshire. And 603-630-6896. We have Sifu Rob Rowe. This is our Kaja Kempo Academy. He's in Franklin, New Hampshire. And it's franklinkarate.com. Or you can call 603-455-7855. And our newest school is Sensei Sarah Chick. She's also teaching Kaja Kempo. And it is in Epson, New Hampshire. So right there at the Rotary in Epson. And it's 603-731-5722. So those four schools are up and running. They're all doing well. Um, lots of kids. Some focus more on kids uh, than adults. But they've got both programs running. And then I've got a school down in Naples, Florida. which Pedro Pinero, he's a fifth level in Pilum. It's White Dragon Martial Arts in Naples. And it's 239-601-4376. And it's a bilingual school. So he teaches both English and in Spanish, which is really helpful in Southern Florida. So his schools are bilingual. Um, those are the schools. I'm in New Hampshire, I'm in Michigan. Um, I don't really want to give out my <laughs> Because my cell phone number is no, also totally my office. Fine. Yeah, my cell totally phone number fine. is all, also my office number. If anyone needs to reach me, they can reach me through Vinny Biochetti. So if you call the 603-387-0779, he usually texts me right away, gives me the information, and I'll get right back to people You know, within a day. Uh, that's not an issue. So that's awesome. Great. Great. And, yeah. You know, this, this has been a lot of fun. You've shared some awesome stuff. and. You know, uh, I think you've probably inspired people to ask as many questions as you may have given them answers. And to me, that's the mark of a good episode when we get people <laughs> thinking. Good. So I'll, I'll leave this to you. How do you want to wind this up? You know, any more, any parting words, any <sighs> final thoughts that you'd give to the people listening? You know, there were, there were a couple things on the survey that you, as you ask about that I thought were really got me searching. And they, they may sound so simple and so trivial, but I think there are some things that can show people um, through their own exploration uh, uh, some ideas about the path of someone, the path of someone who really goes into the martial arts and how, what that path can look like at the end. And uh, one of them is a book that I read. It's a book called The Chronicles of the Tao. And it's uh, by Ding Ming Tao. And it's, it's a, it was originally three books, and I remember reading it back in the 1980s. And I remember reading it because some, it was The Wandering Taoist was the first book, I think. Um, Seven Bamboo Tablets was the second, and Gateway to the Vast World was the third. And it's actually a true story about uh, a young boy who enters the Shaolin Temple. And it's true. And it's he goes through the Japanese occupation of China. He goes through the Cultural Revolution. He makes his trip to America. But his way of growing and what he sees and how what evolves from what he sees as a young boy who just wants to get in and learn how to fight to his statements of, you really don't want to fight. That's not what this is about. You know, it. You don't want to, you really don't want to. And as a martial artist, especially anyone who's been in it for years, the last thing you ever want to have to do is use your martial arts on someone because it isn't the game. You know, it's, it's real. And all the years it takes to get to that place of realization of, I have this in my toolbox and I hope I never have to use it. So let me cultivate all the other ways that I can keep myself and the people I love safe. So I don't have to reach for that. That's kind of what this, this book is about. And I think it's fascinating. It's now in one large book just called The Chronicles of the Tao, but it's broken down into three. And then the, the second thing, just for entertainment, years ago, the, the movie that came out, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, I thought was a fabulous movie on Kung Fu because it was rich on history. So any Chinese practitioners out there that want to know some of the more subtle things about the mysteries and the mystics of Kung Fu, I think that movie showed it. And it also showed, interestingly enough, the equality of women in the martial arts. 
and how that has never been an issue in a patriarchal society like the Chinese. And it's important, I think, for, for young girls and women to understand that as women, we sit differently than men, but we have the same tools within us and we do think differently. And so those come across. So I think it's a long journey for people who want to get into martial arts. I also think those who step in and out, it's okay. You know, because life changes and you can't make it, you'll get back into it later if it's important to you. But when it finally grabs you and wraps around you, it is in your everyday thinking. It, it, it isn't like, oh, I think of Kung Fu class and I'm going to act like this. It just becomes a part of who you are and a more aware of who you are and how you fit in whatever structure you're working through that day. And I, I think the importance of remaining calm in a, in a world that can sometimes be spinning, the importance of understanding what you have to move yourself forward in whatever situation it is and acting on that and, and being clear that things, things are a journey, that, that even there's never an end. You know, we all will get to that eventual end, whatever that is, and transform into whatever your belief system is. But it's, it is a journey. It's a continual journey. And I think the, the rules, the virtues that we see in the martial arts of respect, self-respect, perseverance, compassion, empathy, those things are really critical. But they're not just in the field of martial arts. They're for everyday living. So for those who really want to look at something that you can change your life, go to a school observe, take a couple of classes, use your common sense, pay attention to what your gut tells you. As long as you're enjoying yourself and you're safe and you're having a good time, stay with it. You know, stay with it because it will grow and it will change and you will grow and you will change. It takes time. Nothing can be done in a short amount of time. So it takes time, stay with it. Most of the martial artists I know have been in decades and it, there's a lot of them. So stay with it and, uh, and, and, and the very best to everyone. I wish everyone the best of health, a peaceful life. Um, and if you have the tools that you know that you need, should you ever need them, your life will be more peaceful, believe me. I think you can probably see what I meant in the intro saying that there was, there was a different quality to this episode. And I mean that in the best of ways. Every guest is different and every guest has something to teach. And maybe it's just where I'm at now what I'm facing as I'm handling life and recording these intros and outros, that this one stuck with me. I think that's some of the beauty of what we do is that depending on where you're at in life, these episodes are going to impact you differently. But regardless of where you are and what you took from today's conversation, I'm sure you can appreciate that Sifu Verrigan was open and honest and undoubtedly fervently passionate about her training and her teaching. So thank you. I appreciate you coming on the show, ma'am. And I hope to talk to you again. You can visit whistlekickmartialartsradio.com to see the show notes. And that's where you'll find photos and videos, links, social media, and a lot more for this and every other episode. If you're willing to support us and the work that we do, you have options. Make a purchase at whistlekick.com. And if you do, use the code podcast15 or leave a review, buy a book, or help with the Patreon. Patreon.com slash Whistlekick. If you see Whistlekick out in the wild, make sure you say hi. Talk to whoever's wearing the shirt or the hat, or maybe you're at a tournament. Talk to them. Make a friend. Make a training partner. If nothing else, let them know, hey, we both train. We're trying to better ourselves, and that deserves to be recognized. We'd love to hear your guest suggestions, so send them in. You can follow us on social media at Whistlekick or email me directly, jeremy at whistlekick.com. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day. <laughs>